Masechet Baba Kama Daf Nun He. We will complete the fifth pedic and begin the sixth pedic. We were talking about uh, differences between the Aseret HaDibrot as listed in Shemot versus as listed in Devarim. And so now we have, we, that was regarding Halakha, and now we're going to see an Agada that also compares the two. Sha'al Rabbi Chanina ben Agil et Rabbi Chia bar Abba. Mipnei ma bedibirot harishonot lo nemar bahem tov, u bedibirot ha'achronot nemar bahem tov. So Rabbi Chanina ben Agil et Rabbi Chia bar Abba. How come in the first of Ten Commandments doesn't say the word Tov, and the second one it does. Uh, they're talking about here in the commandment regarding Kabed et Abicha Vetimecha and Shemot. It says, Leman Yarichunya Mechal Dama, so that your days will be long on the land that Hashem has promised. Um, incidentally, um, the, the, in the context here, it's talking about not personal life, but rather a national life, right? Because it's Al Hadama, meaning on the, in the land of Israel. So that if there is a Respect for parents in the society in general, then that bodes well for that for that nation and the nation of Israel. Then will be able to last long on, in the land of Israel. Otherwise, um, that will lead to a breakdown in respect and authority and uh, values, and then the nation of Israel will will be exiled. So that's what it says here in Devarim. However, it says everything is the same. As God has promised, it adds the sin. This seems to be a reference back to Shemot, um, as Hashem has already commanded. And now it says, That's the same. But here it adds, Not only that you should be long in the land, but that it will be good for you in the land. That's the same. Um, so you see that everything is basically the same, except that here it adds, Lema'an Yitavlach. So why is this added here? But it's not in the uh, original version in Sefer Shemot. So he answers, well, before you ask me why it says Tov, first uh, let's establish if it says Tov. Now it's hard to believe that this uh, sage, uh, Rabbi Chiyabar Abba, did not know the basic text of Sefer Devarim versus Sefer Shemot, and he didn't know if the word Tov is in there or not. What do you mean he doesn't know? He has to check. Could be he's, what he's uh, saying is something deeper, is that it's not actually clear that the Sefer Shemot is talking about the first set of Ten Commandments and Sefer Devarim is the set, what's described in the second set, set of Ten Commandments because even Sefer Devarim is saying this was it's, it's recalling what was said at Har Sinai. It's just a, it's a repeat of, of, of the of Ma'amad Har Sinai. So really both are um, presentations of what's at Ma'amad Har Sinai. And so, right, is it really true that the first ones didn't have Tov and the second ones do have Tov? Maybe the first ones did. And so he was like, I don't, I don't even know if I can establish the premise of your question that is with, there is a difference between Dibrot Rishonot and Dibrot Acharonot. In any case, he didn't have an answer. Um, so this is his way of saying, listen, I, I don't know. Um, but you should go ask Rabbi Tanhom Bar Hanilai because he studied with Rabbi Yoshua ben Nevi. And Rabbi Yoshua ben Nevi is an expert in Agada. I'm more focused on Halakha. Ask me one of the questions from the previous staff about the subtle differences between them in areas of Halakha. Agada, go there. Azali Gabe, so Rabbi Hanina ben Agilu asked the question in the first place, uh, went to Rabbi Yoshua, um, went to the student of Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi, who was Rabbi Tanhum bar Hanilai. Amale mimenu lo shamati. He says, Rabbi Hanina says, I never heard a tradition about this from Rabbi Yoshua ben Levi. However, Elakach amadi Shemuel bar Nahum, achi imo shel rav acha bar Rabbi Hanina, bamri la avi imo shel rav achai bar Rabbi Hanina, hoil v'sofa, so even though I didn't hear it from Rabbi Yosheb Levi, I did hear it from Shumel Ban Nahum, who was either the uncle or the grandfather of Rav Aha uh, Rabbi Hanina. And his answer was that in the first Tiberot, it does not say Tov, he's accepting the premise, and the first set of said, first uh, Luchot, set of Ten Commandments, it does not say Tov, because they were going to be broken, and we don't want 
the good to be broken. You don't want to say after Cheta Egel when Moshe broke the tablets, that's, that's it. Good is, is broken forever. So the uh, kind of um, a foreshadowing that, that these were going to be broken, you know what? Or, or now reflecting now later that the fact that they were broken, so the word tov does not appear in the report about the first set of Ten Commandments. And so what? Even if they're going to break, so what? So they're broken, right? So why can't you break the word tov? And the answer is, all right, we don't want to say that goodness has ceased from Israel. You might might think that if you break the, the first luchot, I mean, it is a way of tearing apart a contract. The luchot are a contract. Breaking them is okay. You broke the contract. That's it. It's good. It's done. But we don't want that to say that that's permanent and there's no, therefore there's never any more goodness and blessing uh, from Hashem, right? There has to be a possibility of repair and repentance and mercy. And so, uh, in order to say, no, goodness is not gone. There's still goodwill between Hashem and B'nai Israel, And so, therefore, that is included only in the second set of Ten Commandments that is permanent and not in the first that was broken. All right, beautiful derasha. And furthermore, on the symbolism of Tov, if someone sees the letter Tet, some people dream about letters, so Tet stands for good. So that means it's a good sign. Um, wait a second, just because it says the word Tov in the Torah, so that's why Tet stands for Tov, but Tet, tet also stands for negative uh, words. Like here in Yeshaya, this has a lot of Tets, four Tets in a row. Um, and this means I'm going to sweep uh, uh, B'nai Sel away with a broom of destruction. So maybe Tet means something negative. And the answer is Had Tet Kamri. Now we're talking about when one sees one Tet in a dream, that's Tov. But if you see uh, multiple tets, well then that might refer to this negative pasuk. But one tet is good. Emma tumata bishule. Hold on. How do you know it's referring to the word tov? Look at this word. It has only one tet, but it's talking from echa. Talking about the sin of B'nai Israel is in her skirts. And so that could be a negative sign. And the answer is tet bet kamrina. No, you saw in the dream not just one letter tet, but you saw a tet bet. Here there's no tet. This is tumata. is not tet bet. Tet bet stands for tov. In Aramaic, you don't even need a vav, you just say tab. And so that, that by itself means good. Emma tav'u ba'arishare. Hold on. But we have a, a negative word, tav'u. The gates of the of the Yushalayim are sunk. And so that's and that starts with tet bet. So maybe tet bet also is a negative. How do you know it's a positive? Because we're going to start from the beginning. Why are you going all the way to Echa? If you start from the beginning of the Torah, from Bereshit until um, uh, the Pasuk that Hashem saw the light, there is no letter tet. The first letter tet is right after that. Ki tob. So therefore the tet stands for good because that's the very beginning of the Torah, the creation of light is also the creation of the very first Tet. So Tet um, stands for God, unless it's uh, in some other context, uh, we have two Tets or something like that. But otherwise, Tet by itself is a good sign. Rabbi Yosha ben Levi says um, another some, something that you might think is negative, but is actually positive. If you see a eulogy in your dream, you dream, dream about a eulogy. That doesn't sound like, seem like a good sign. Uh, but he says, no, no, don't worry, that's good. We take the word hesped and we split it into two. And we take hes, and that's hasu, uh, that, uh, that from heaven, they had pity on him. Uft, and the pe, pedalit is pedauhu and was redeemed. That means that, you know, you might have been worthy of death, but in heaven they had, they had, they had mercy and they redeemed you from death, and you're all right, it is in fact a good sign. However, that's only if you see the word hesped spelled out, but if you actually are, are you know, witnessing, I guess, your own um, funeral and hearing hesped, hespedim, then that might not be a good sign. And in general, the rabbis, um, this is in, in, Masech, in the, in the Masechet Berachot, have a whole dream dictionary, and in general, they take anything that may seem negative and turn it into a positive. They don't want people to be anxious about their dreams, and then they're going to go to these professional dream interpreters, magicians who to steal people's money and make them uh, worried and dependent on them. Uh, these were bad people, and so the rabbis 
uh, did not want people to be to be obsessing about negative dreams, and therefore they created a whole positive dictionary and even a prayer that's in uh, uh, a lot of sidurim today. Hatabat chalom, right? You come and say I had a, a seems to be a bad dream, and so the uh, prayer says, no, we'll turn it to good, and just as long as you interpret it for good then it'll have a positive effect and uh, you can go on and not worry about it. Back to the Mishnah that says uh, when we're talking about um, animals that fall into a pit and the owner of the pit is liable, that includes both uh, regular and domesticated but also undomesticated animals and birds. Those also um, they uh, incur liability if they fall into someone's pit. Regarding this Mishnah, Rabbi Yehuda Nasi taught that uh, these three birds, a rooster, a pheasant, and a peacock, um, although they are similar, and you might think that they are all uh, variations of one species, and then you might think that you're allowed to mate them together with each other, he's saying, not true, they are kilayim, you're not allowed to mate these three together. So we ask Peshita, isn't that obvious that these are th- totally different? No, I might have thought that since they are reared together, in fact, in the, in the wild, these three three will not mate together, but when placed into captivity, they do. And so it's not clear which one do you follow. So this is even though that in captivity they mate with each other, but that is not natural. That you're not allowed to do. We have to go by what they do in the wild, which is they are separate species. And so you might have thought that they're one. And that's what Abiyu Danasit had to say. Tell us that, no, no, go by what's, what they do in the wild and they do not mate, and therefore one is prohibited to mate them. Amar Shemuel, Avaz ve'avaz habar kilaim ze baze. Shemuel tells us that a domestic goose and a wild goose don't think that they are just two different variations of the same species. They're actually different species, and uh, therefore one may not mate them together. Matkifla rava bar rav hanan. My time, my ilam amishum dehai arich ko'ayeh vehai zutar ko'ayeh. So rava bar rav hanan questions this and says, what's the reason that you're saying they're different species? Is it because one has a long beak and one has a short beak? Well, then every time you see some kind of, some vari- physical variation, are you going to say that these two uh, are different species? I'll give you another example. If you have a Persian camel and an Arabian camel, one of them has a thick neck and one of them has, has a thick neck. So you're going to say there also, they're different species, but that's not true regarding those different uh, camels. They're just different variations, but they're all camels. So, so, so what if um, one has a big beak and a short beak? Here's uh, some a domestic goose, and here's a, um, a different kind of goose. And I don't know, the beaks look similar to me, but you can go check them out in your local zoo. Um, anyway, um, so just because it's uh, small variations doesn't make them different species. That's his challenge to Shemuel. Rather, Abaye says, in fact, the domestic goose and the wild goose are different species, not because of the beaks, um, but rather because um, the domestic, uh, the, the wild goose has its testicles protruding while the domestic goose has um, them inside. That is a more significant difference. Abi was talking about the males. Rav Papa says the difference in the females um, that the wild goose releases only one egg at a time where, into its ovary, whereas the domestic goose re- releases several eggs into its ovary. And so that shows that they are, in fact, different species and one would not allowed, would not be allowed to mate them together. So does the prohibition of kilaim apply to fish? And uh, the answer is yes. Someone who mates together two different uh, species that live in the sea, that is, viol- is is a violation, and he gets malkut. What's the reason? Um, because 
the Torah says the word liminehu when he creates all the all the th- all the different uh, species each in the, in their category. That says the word liminehu not uh, uh, not only for that which is on the land, but also says liminehu for that which is in the sea. And therefore, just like on the land, liminehu, you have to keep the species separately as they are pristine in creation and not metal. Um, with the uh, perfection of creation, so too, this is the word liminehu regarding fish, and therefore those also, one is not allowed to bring and mate them together. Okay, that's the kilayim of mating. Now we're going to switch over into uh, kilayim of w- working two different species together on the land. Uh, okay, so you know we can't um, take two uh, different animals and make them pull. Uh, a plow or anything uh, uh, together. But what about if you pull um, a wagon um, uh, with a goat and a shibuta, which is a big fish? Uh, seems uh, unusual, impractical to actually do this. But still, theoretically, let's say you tied a rope to a goat and you tied a rope to this big fish and then you put them together um, uh, onto a wagon and so they're both pulling it. Does that, does that count as uh, the, pro- the prohibition against um, uh, kilayim, uh, for pulling different, uh, uh, pulling something with different animals. On the one hand, we say we could say these, uh, they're in their, each are their own, in their own domain. A goat can't go into the water and the shibuta can't go into land. So each are in their own domain and therefore it's fine. Uh, there's no, they're not doing anything wrong. Or do we say, but yeah, right now they are both driving a wagon. The wagons at the, on the edge is on the seashore and uh, so they are both working together so it's still a problem Ravina wants to say no it should not be uh, it should not be a problem because look at an analogous case um, this now of Kilayim comparing all different kinds of Kilayim this time Kilayim of planting different seeds together if someone had some wheat and barley in his hand and he sows the wheat in Eretz Yisrael but the barley outside of Eretz Yisrael. Now you can't put them together but here one is on this side of the border and one's on that side of the border similar to um, one here being on the land and one being in the ocean. So would you say that here one is one is liable? For sure they're not liable because um, they're on they're in different lands and the laws of Kilaim don't even apply outside the land of Israel. So surely here um, you would not be liable. You don't mix them together because they're in different regions. And so to hear it, that should be the same thing. Why are you asking this question? If one's on the land and one's in the ocean, these are completely different domains and uh, it should not be a problem. But we reject that. No, they're not analogous because in the case of planting in the land and outside the land of Israel, in the land of Israel, that's where there is a prohibition of kilayim. Outside the land of Israel, there is no biblical prohibition of kilayim at all. So it's not just a case of being in two different domains. One of these domains, the law doesn't apply. So there's no way that you can violate kilayim if half of it is in a place, one of the spe- one of the seeds as in a place where Kilaim does not even apply. Whereas here, the law of Kilaim does, uh, does, uh, is in effect both on land and in the sea. Uh, so that Kilaim of two animals together is prohibited, Kilaim of two fish together is prohibited. And now the question is just can you combine the two domains together or not? And so we leave that question standing. Hadran alach shor shenagach et hapara chazakim u beruchim. And now we move to the next Next perek, ha kones son la dir ve na abe fana kara oi ve asavizika patur. Lona abe fana kara oi ve asavizika hayav. Well, before we're talking about oxen, now we're moving into sheep. We're going to get us going to note the significance of that. And so now someone owns some sheep and he puts them into a pen and he uh, locks the door um, uh, appropriately. He puts the, a proper fence, a proper lock that uh, normally will keep the sheep in. But somehow they, are, they escape and they cause damage to someone else. The owner of the sheep is not liable because he did what he had to do. He put the normal type of fence. However, if he did, it did not lock it in an appropriate way, he put a flimsy fence or just left it unlocked, 
and the sheep go out, then the owner of the sheep is liable. Okay, now another example. If somehow the, 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 the pen was breached at night, or thieves came, and they knocked down, they opened up the fence, and then the sheep went out on their own and caused damage, the owner is not liable. Now, this say, why do we need to know this? We already said that if, as long as he put a fe- proper fence, uh, if they somehow get out, he's not liable. So here it's just saying the same thing, um, uh, but it just happens to be that it was, could be that thieves broke down the fence. What's the difference if thieves did it or uh, a strong wind did it? Um, so this seems to be adding another chidush that not only is the owner of the sheep not liable, but also the thief is not liable. If the thief just broke the fence because he's looking for, I don't know, a gold in there, um, and uh, but he left, he didn't touch the sheep, then and the sheep go out, not only is the owner, but also the thief is not liable for damage that the owner does. That's in contrast to the following. If the sheep remove, if the thieves remove the sheep and then they you know, they stole the sheep and they, they had them somewhere else and then the sheep got, got away from the thieves and went and caused damage, then the thieves themselves are liable because they're the ones that took them out. But if they left them in, then the thieves are not liable. Nobody's liable. If the owner left the animal in the sun and it causes it to suffer, and it's not going to want to stay there. So it left it in a bad position. Or similarly, if he, he, he gave the sheep over to someone deaf or not mentally competent or a minor, and they are not able to safeguard it properly, and it went and caused damage, the owner is liable. However, if he gave it to a shepherd, a proper shepherd who knows what he's doing, and is responsible, uh, then it enters into the place of the shepherd, meaning the responsibility of the shepherd, and then if it goes and causes damage, then it'll be the shepherd that will be responsible, not the owner. If an animal fell into a garden, let's say it slipped and it fell down into someone's garden, and it got benefit. It could have gotten benefit by, let's say, it fell down and some flowers uh, broke its fall, but it damaged the flowers, or if it ate in there, so the owner has to pay for the benefit that his animal got. If it walked in in its normal way into someone else's field or garden, um, then the owner has to pay for anything that it, that it causes damage to, including trampling, right? So this is going to be Shen and Regel. That's what we're talking about now. Um, the previous uh, uh, Mishnah was, um, I was talking more about goring, a keren, but here this is shen and regel. So um, how do you assess what the amount of damage is to someone's garden? So we um, what we don't do is we don't look at the garden itself and say, you know, how much is it, how much is it worth and how much is the damage, but rather we figure out the damage by looking at the entire betsea. Betsea is a 50 by 50 ama um, a section of the field. And we say um, this entire field, how much was it worth before the damage and how much is it worth now after the damage? So this is going to be a smaller uh, amount than if we look at each particular flower that was uh, that was damaged, right? If you take an entire field, entire house, and it was worth a million before, and now that there's a small damage to one section, it's worth okay, a little less than a million. But if you look at uh, uh, if you look at the thing itself. Um, then it will be a higher assessment. So we go with the lower assessment. Rabbi Shimon Omer, Achla perot kimurim meshalemet perot kimurim im se'a se'a im sa'tayim sa'tayim. Rabbi Shimon says, when you appraise it, you have to also look at the type of, um, uh, not only what was damaged, but also at what stage it was. If it, it was, if the animal came and ate, ate ripe produce, then the owner has to pay the value for the ripe produce. Um, but if it's not ripe, then he does, then it, then it's less. Um, if it ate one se'a, it pays one se'a. If it's two se'a, he has to pay two se'a. It's not a one, uh, it's not a one um, size fits all, but you have to look at the details of exactly what was damaged and how much it was worth.
Gemara, Tenor Rabbanan, Ezo Karaoi, Ezo Shelo Karaoi. We said that the owner of the sheep has to put an appropriate uh, fence, an appropriate safeguard. What's the definition of that? Delish Yechola Mod Beroch Mesuya, Zeo Karaoi. Veshana Yechola Mod Beder Mesuya, Zehu Shelo Karaoi. If you put a gate that can withstand a normal wind, that's fine. You don't have to worry about a tornado coming in, uh, a normal wind. But if it can't withstand a normal wind, even just a regular wind that is you can expect, and that breaks, that, that knocks down the fence, then that's inappropriate. So as long as you put down, uh, put an appropriate fence, uh, patur, but if you put a very, very flimsy one that a regular wind can come and knock down, then uh, the owner is chayav if the sheep get out and cause damage. So Rabbi Mane Bar Patish was one to ask, who was the author of this Mishnah that says, even if you put a medium level fence, right? Low level fence is one that gets knocked down with, uh, with any wind, with a, even, even with a normal wind. Um, a medium level will withstand a normal wind, but not a, a, a very strong wind. A high level uh, fence would be one that withstands even a abnormally strong wind. So this Mishnah says, medium fence is good enough. Who is the Mishnah, who is the Tana that says that for a short Mu'ad, why is it talking about Shor Mu'ad? Well, it didn't say here what it is, but it is talking in the rest of it about Shen and Regel. Regarding Shen and Regel, there is no distinction between Tam and Mu'ad. One uh, animal is considered Mu'ad all the time. There is no Tam for Shen and Regel. If an animal goes into someone else's property and either tramples or eats, um, causes damage in a way that is normal behavior um, uh, and uh, and or uh, that it benefits from, then one has to pay a full amount, right? That's Mu'ad. The distinction between Tam and Mu'ad, according to most opinions, is only in uh, Keren in the Rishu Tarabim. Um, uh, okay, so this is, uh, so we're talking about uh, Mu'ad. Who is the opinion that says for a short Mu'ad, a medium level fence is sufficient and the owner is not liable. And the answer is Rabbi Udahi Ditnan, Kishado Bala be Moserav and Alephan of Karaui, Vyasav Hizik, Ehad Tam Vehad Muad Hayab, Tibre Rabbi Meir, this is Machloket we saw already, uh, it's in the Mishnah back on Mem He, um, that if the owner tied up its uh, ox with reins or a fence and uh, appropriately, medium level, and it went and caused damage if it's whether it's tam or mu'ad one is liable according to the bimeir because the bimeir thinks that uh, at least for is talking about keren here um we're talking about ox um uh, that one needs a high level um uh, a safeguard both for short tam and short mu'ad so it can't be the bimeir because he says for mu'ad you need a high level medium level is not sufficient so he can't be the author of this Mishnah. Rabbi Yehuda Omer, Tam Hayab Mu'ad Patush, Namar, Velo Yishmerenu Be'alav, Veshamur Huzeh. It is the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda because he says regarding uh, 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 regarding Keren, that if a, sh- a short tam, one needs the highest level. Um, uh, and otherwise, he would be, for a medium level, he would be liable. However, Rabbi Uda, uh paradoxically thinks that if a short mu'ad, as long as it's medium level, that's sufficient and he's patur. Um, why? Well, the Pasuk says regarding short mu'ad that, and he didn't watch it. So that means uh, if it's as long as he watches it a normal way, then that's sufficient. So why should a mu'ad be more lenient? Um, so we said back then, maybe because since once it's a shod mu'ad, then everybody knows stay away from that shod, right? We hear already, it already uh, damaged three times or killed three times. So people will stay away from it. I'm um, kind of like, you know, motorcycles are more dangerous, but they also make a lot of noise. And so everybody knows that they're dangerous and they make a lot of noise. So uh, other drivers will stay away from them. And so every people, everybody will stay away. And therefore, it doesn't need as high a safeguard um, as a short time, according to the Biuda. So that's, uh, this applies nicely to our Mishnah. Our Mishnah is talking about Shen and Regel. But Shen and Regel, it's always, are always Mu'ad. And, uh, and therefore, um, uh, this our Mishnah teaches that you need just a normal, safe, medium level safeguard, and that would be sufficient. That must be the biuda, because if it was a bi uh, meir, uh, then he would require the highest level. It also can't be the third opinion to be Eliezer Omer and Lo Shemira El Asaki. And the says that a short Mu'ad, even the highest level, does not protect the owner. The only way to protect the, the for the owner to be protected against having to pay is with a knife by killing his ox. 
Um, otherwise, there's no way to safeguard a short Mu'ad. And so certainly this Mishnah would not be to be Eliezer, because we're talking again about Shen and Regel, that are by definition Mu'ad, and it says that a medium safeguard is sufficient. Okay, so that's conclusion number one, that this, that this Mishnah is the opinion of Rabbi Yehuda. But then we want to try and see, can it be someone else's opinion? It can even be Rabbi Meir. When is Rabbi Meir so machmir? And he says that Tam and Mu'ad, you need the highest level. That's only if it gores. But for damages of Shen and Regel, the Torah explicitly goes out of its way and says, you only need normal safeguard. It's true that Shen and Regel are Mu'ad in the sense that you have to pay the full amount. Um, but it doesn't mean that the uh, level of uh, safeguard is the same. For the, for Keren, it's the highest level. But for Shen and Regel, all you need is regular uh, safeguarding. The Torah limits the um the liability of safeguarding. And we see this in the statement of Rabbi El Azar, who, and some say it's actually in a Baraita. The Torah limited the level of safeguard required for four items, and they are Bor, Esh, Shen, and Regel. And we're going to prove each one. For a pit, it says if someone opens a pit or digs a pit and doesn't cover it. So that's just if you didn't cover it, then it's a problem. As long as you cover it, that's enough, right? You don't have to go to the highest extent and fill it in, right? As long as you cover it, which is a medium safeguard, you're okay. So that's what we learned, that um, all you need is a medium safeguard for a pit. Esh says, you have to pay, the one who causes the fire has to pay. So that means you only have to pay if you cause a fire. That would certainly be causing it directly or being negligent and letting your fire get out of hand, then you're liable. But as long as you took normal safeguards, okay, I had a fire pit, I did normal safeguards, and then beyond my control, it got out of hand, so then I don't have to pay. Shen uh, says if it goes and eats in someone else's field, one is only liable if it's a case similar to actually pushing him, pushing my animal to go and eat in someone else's field. All right, and either I do it directly or I'm just negligent and don't watch it at all. Um, then I am liable. But as long as I took proper safeguards and I put a normal fence, I am not liable. Regel de shechiach uh, Regel also says, if I send my animal and let it loose to another field and it tramples over there. So when am I liable? When I let it loose and trample. Or if I'm just so negligent and it goes on its own and I don't do anything about it, then I am liable. But as long as I took normal safeguard, I am not liable. So um, uh, you, you see that the um, the Torah specifically for Shen and Regel says that you don't need a high level, you only need a medium level, and therefore um, uh, this uh, Mishnah, our Mishnah can be the opinion of Rabbi Meir, and he distinguishes between Keren, which is not a high level, and Shen and Regel, which need of just a normal level. Another Braita supports the same uh, conclusion that um, that we learned that Vishilach is referring to Regel, right? Because uh, Pasuk in Yeshaya, we quoted these Pasukim all the way in the beginning of the Masechet, um, that sends forth the feet of an ox. Um, so here he has the word Vishilach and Regel together. So that's how we learn that the word Vishilach in the Torah also is referring to damage by Regel. And the word Ubi'er uh, uh, is found in uh, Sefer Melachim. It says Yeva'er and it's referring to eating, consuming, digesting, and, uh, and destroying in that way. And that's how we know that Bi'ayr is referring to damage by Shen, damage by eating. And uh, the Baraita continues and says, Tama David ke'an v'shilach u'bi'ayr hala'avid la. One is only liable if one does it in a similar manner to the way that Torah describes, which is an active sending, letting loose 
um, causing it to feed. If one has an active part or negligent um, and doesn't stop it, then one is liable. But as long as you did took normal measures and put a normal fence there, that, uh, that, that is sufficient. And even a BMA would agree to this. All right, now it could now now right now it could be to be Yehuda as we said, or it could be to be Meir. Now the Abba wants to prove that in fact the be Meir is a better reading. Amar Abba matnitin na me daika de katani son mikadi beshor ka askinan veate veate nitni shor mai shena de katani son la mishum da Torah miata bishmiratan. So the Abba says that uh, the Mishnah, if you read it carefully, um, really works better according to the be Meir because. It's talking about sheep. Now, in the previous pedic, we were talking about oxen the whole time. So, if, since we were talking, we were talking about oxen. Why not give an example of an ox and you put a fence in front of the ox? Why the, t- the author of the Mishnah switch over to sheep? Is it not because it wants to specifically say we're talking about something different here? We're talking about Shen and Regel only, and the Torah has a different law according to the Bimeir and says for uh, Shen and Regel you only need a lower level. And that's why, if it was t- t- still talking about Keren, then it could have continued talking about Oxen. But that's why this Mishnah says, okay, we finished talking about Keren, and there you need a high level for a short time or short Mo'ad, the Bimeir says. And here, uh, oh, we're talking about a new topic. Now we're talking about Shen and Regel, because we're talking about sheep. Sheep don't go in gore normally. Uh, um, uh, and so we're talking about sheep so that we could set to indicate now we're talking about Shen and Regel and Shen and Regel even if Bimeir would agree that medium level uh, safeguard is sufficient. So isn't this a good actually actually a proof that it is in fact the Bimeir and that's a better, better reading than the Biyuda. And then we add, we conclude not necessarily love mishum dechan keren laketiva ba shen veregel hu ketichtiv ba vekamash malan de shen veregel de moadin hu shema amina. No, in fact, the Mishnah can read very well according to Rabbi Yehuda. The thing is that the word um, keren is not said regarding sheep. Um, whenever the Torah talks about Keren, it uses the example of ox, which makes sense. Um, but Shen and Regel, those, in, in those cases, the Torah does give the example of sheep. So why does this Mishnah tell us about sheep? If, according to the Biuda, the law is the same for all of them, that media only needs medium level. You, you, he, he, he says already that you need medium level um, uh, uh, um, safeguard for a Shor Mo'ad regarding Keren. Um, so, in fact, they're all the same. No, but he wants to teach you that regarding Shen and Regel, that don't think that they are like a Tam and that they are, the law there would be different. Rather, Shen and Regel are always called Mu'ad and therefore we treat Shen and Regel, uh, no matter if it's the first time or the tenth time, we treat that the same as a Shor Mu'ad regarding Keren. And just like Shor Mu'ad regarding Keren, all you need is medium according to the Biuda. Here he wants to say Se. Because it wants to tell, indicate, oh, we're talking about Shen and Regel. Shen and Regel, also Mu'ad, same, uh, same as the others. But in fact, the Halakha, would, according to the Biyuda, would be the same. If it was a Shor and a and Shor Mu'ad and a Gord by Keren, then it would also need the same, uh, same level, medium level. But this Mishnah is giving us the added Chidush that Shen and Regel, no matter what the animal is, typically it's a uh, uh, Se, um, also there's it's always it's always Mu'ad, and therefore also a medium level um, safeguard is sufficient. Shema mina baruch Adonai leolam. Amen ve'amen.